Conference can report on House Bill number 3872, an act relating to higher education. The report is addressed to the Honorable Melissa Hortman, Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable David J. Osmick, President of the Senate. We, the undersigned conferees for House Bill number 3872, report that we've agreed upon the items in dispute and recommend it as follows. <clears throat> the report is signed by four of the five conferees on the part of the House and four of the five conferees on the part of the Senate. Bernardi moves that the report of the Conference Committee on House Bill number 3872 be adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Conference Committee. I recognize the author of the motion, the member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, it is a privilege and an honor to be before this body today to bring this conference committee report to, for a vote. All Minnesota families deserve a quality education and the opportunity to be able to thrive and succeed, no matter where they're born, where they live in our state, or what they look like. I'd like to share some of the highlights from our bill. In order to address the needs of our health care workforce, we have included certified nursing assistants and also allied tech workforce scholarships to provide relief to our long-term care facilities and are still, that are still significantly impacted by shorting staff, staff, uh, shorting, um, staffing shortages. We have over 15,000 openings for CNAs in the state of Minnesota. This bill also addresses affordability. The bill will help tackle the cost of higher education by making investments in the state grant program. 65,000 Minnesota students will receive an increase in their state grant. This bill focuses on equity as well. We want to increase, we want to increase opportunities for all students in our state, students of color, indigenous students, and our black students. Our, 20, our investments here will provide opportunities for our underrepresented teachers to be able to earn grants to be do their classroom teaching in our, in, um, for their college education and be able to finish up their credentials and get into our classroom. So our students have, have students that more represent our student body, have teachers that represent our student body. This bill also makes historic changes to improve higher education access for students with intellectual disabilities. With the inclusive higher education grants in this bill, we will open doors for opportunities for students that have been underserved and um, underserved for years. Our bill also gives much needed funding to our tribal colleges, who for the past 30 years have been the only public schools in Minnesota required to educate Minnesota students without any state support. We have a lot to be proud of in this bill. I was a child of uh, teenage wed parents, and we now have a, finally, the Minnesota Student Support Initiative, Parent Support Initiative, addresses the holistic needs of expected and parenting college students across Minnesota to support their educational goals. During COVID, it became very apparent how much parents are impacted and the challenges they have finishing their credentials. Parenting students make up 23% of Minnesota's undergraduate students and access, and access to adequate resources have been shown to positively increase parents' enrollment, persistence, and completion. And watching my mom finish her education as a young child helped make me be successful in, in earning my degree as well. Our higher education budget is student-centered with lots of good provisions that will deliver critical support to our students now while delivering a brighter, equitable, and prosperous future for Minnesota students, their families, and Minnesota's economy. I would like to thank our, 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 our bipartisan staff, our, our staff, and um, all of the conferees and the people that have served on our committee to get us to this point. And uh, Representative O'Neill, our lead Republican on the other side, for her work throughout this, um, this biennium. With that, Mr. Speaker, I stand for questions. Is there any discussion to the conference committee report? 
There being no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to adopt the conference committee report on House File 3872, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. Aye. The motion prevails, and the clerk will give the bill its third reading <clears throat> as amended by conference. Third reading, House File number 3872, as amended by conference. Third reading is amended by conference. Any further discussion? I recognize the member from Clay, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I'm not going to talk really long here because I think we've talked about higher ed enough on this space um, and on this floor. Just saying thank you to the individuals who came to the table to really have honest conversations. I know uh, Representative O'Neill is not in the chamber, but I'm sure she's listening. And I just want to recognize that what happens when we can come together with a really small target, I think we're all disappointed in that piece. But coming together collectively to find ways that we can innovate a new way of higher education. Um, a couple of those things, I, I really strongly believe in reducing barriers to education. I say over and over and over that higher education needs to be an opportunity for all of us and not just a privilege for some of us. Um, and so a couple of the things that we've been able to do here um, is, I mean, one, our tribal colleges, our TCUs are extremely important. Um, what we know is that when those students graduate, we have almost seven 70% of those graduates actually feed into our local um, state institutions. And so it's a way for us to increase our student population. Also, we've put a lot into workforce development. We've added new areas of that, things that are important to all of us here, uh, making sure that we provide the opportunities to Minnesota State to be able to give scholarships to students who are trying to go out into the world in different areas, including um, social work, construction, and policing. Uh, we've also looked in greater Minnesota, understanding that there are things that are really important to some of you, um, particularly um, around NRI and making sure that those things are things that we continue to invest in um, in Greater Minnesota as a Greater Minnesota member. Those things are really important to me. Um, and then also supporting our students with intellectual disabilities. We talk a lot about access and barriers, and um, I just think we need to make sure that every single student in Minnesota who wants access to higher education institutions or higher education opportunities should have that. And I am so proud of the work that we did collectively to be able to say to our students and our next Next generations that we we care about you we see you and we're actively working the best that we can to reduce the barriers um, to education for all of you I um, I encourage you all to, to vote green thank you I recognize the member from Anoka representative West thank you mr. speaker and with this bill this is just government drunk with taxpayer dollars I mean we already passed a budget and this is a sprinkling, it's only about $20 million, which is peanuts to us, but these institutions have already received millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in federal funds. And it's gotten so bad, I mean, in the higher education bill, so I typically think of higher education as a, being colleges, post-secondary, you know, high, different from high school and elementary schools, but we're funding $306,000 for a high school in Owatonna. $306,000 in a higher education bill. I mean, a million dollars for the Owatonna Learn to Earn Coalition. Why are we spending a million dollars for a single city? Don't we all want to have a million dollars for our cities? It doesn't make sense. This is not the kind of thing that should be done in the higher education bill. And it's even worse because it's literally to high schools. Well, we want to make sure high schools are top of the line, but that doesn't belong in a higher education bill. Now, I'm pretty sure, certain this wasn't uh, the chair's provision, but this is not how it should be done. This bill is just more wasteful spending. We, we have a budget already. We don't need to do it, and I would encourage members to uh, vote no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Chair Bernardi for working very hard to make sure that our student voices were uplifted in this process and to make sure that every member of the conference committee was heard as we were debating this bill. Uh, she's very, um, she takes the approach of listening first, 
building that consensus and then making sure that the bill will work for all of us. So thank you, Chair Bernardi, and I know that this is an important topic for you. Peanuts to us. There's not one dollar that we spend in this body that should ever be classified as peanuts. Um, people work hard to pay their taxes, and we should honor the fact that their work has gone into the investments we make in our state. And so I want to uplift the hard work that our families do every day to make our state run. Um, the investments that we're making in our institutions this, this year are incredibly small. There, we have been underfunding, systemically underfunding our higher education institutions across this state for decades. We are not upholding the promises that we made to our families and to our students in our own statutes. So to say that this bill is anything wasteful is to not acknowledge our part in the rising cost of tuition in this state. So I want to say to the students who are paying that high tuition today, I'm sorry for that. And I will pledge to you to continue to work for as long as I'm in the legislature to bring down that cost for you and to make sure that this body and the House of Representatives and the Senate work collectively for your good and your future. With that, Mr. Speaker, I, and I urge everyone to vote green for this bill. Thank you. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. All right, we'll pass on Representative Garofalo. Mr. Speaker, can you hear me now? Representative Garofalo, we can hear you. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, uh, thank you, Representative Bernardi, for the work that you put in on this bill, as well as the work you've done on previous bills, and thank you for your service to our state. Uh, members, I'll be voting no on the bill today, and I'd like to highlight a couple of reasons why uh, that is the case. Number one, it's important to remember that we already have a funded budget for the next two years. Uh, just because there's money available on the bottom line does not mean we have to spend it. And this is another example of that. Uh, this bill includes $20 million for the current fiscal year, as well as over $25 million, I believe $26 million uh, in the tails. Members, we give higher education institutions in this state billions of dollars. And what we are being told is that in order to fund additional priorities, in order to have additional services provided to our students and to lower their tuition payments, there isn't one penny in higher education waste right now. There isn't one single dollar that can be cut or efficiencies can be granted in order to provide that. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, that's clearly uh, not the case. Uh, there are efficiencies to be gained. There are, There is too much spending taking place in the state of Minnesota. This is the first in a series of bills of where we're going to see that a big government that is spending too much money uh, is demanding more money, and we, should not be, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Despite the billions of dollars that came into our state in federal COVID assistance, we're seeing a government that is now feeding on itself. Mr. Speaker and members, there's no reason to be voting for this bill. Uh, again, Minnesota government has plenty of money. We should be focusing on tax relief and lowering the cost of government, not by spending more money. Mr. Speaker and members, I would urge members to vote no. Thank you. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. You know, we have a fully funded state budget and there's no need for Democrats to be forcing millions of new spending for higher ed. On top of the billions that the higher ed systems have already received in our last budget we passed. And Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the chair, Bernardi, would yield. She will yield, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, uh, Chair Bernardi. Uh, I appreciated being on the committee with you. And we talked a lot about uh, freezing tuition or helping students afford college. Uh, it was recently reported that the U of M, University of Minnesota, 
Those students uh, will be facing a tuition increase of 3.5%, and at the Minsky systems, uh, it's likely facing about another 3.5% on that system as well. Uh, even the bill that was first presented by the House Democrats, uh, there was, uh, can you share with the body what tuition freeze uh, efforts were made for the University of Minnesota and Minsky system? I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for that question. And what I want to um, share with you is, is that it wasn't, we didn't have that, that tuition freeze that you're talking about. We made tuition free for students attending two-year colleges and uh, two-year colleges and technical schools. So tuition was free for those students. That's what was in our bill. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, members. Uh, what we heard was the priorities were not for all students to be able to afford a higher education. Initially, it was for select students, and to the taxpayers of Minnesota and the students, thousands of students that are all struggling to get good grades, educate themselves, provide for a better lot in life for themselves and a, a better future, some of them didn't care or the Democrats didn't care about them, and this bill does nothing to hold tuition in line. And so uh, I'd like to apologize to the students at the University of Minnesota that are going to be facing a 3.5% increase, and to their families and parents. And same with uh, all the other students at the U of M systems that will be facing a 3.5% increase. And never was it a consideration to help freeze tuition at these systems. Uh, even before uh, budget agreements. And so we have misplaced priorities on what we're doing in our higher ed system. Uh, Minnesota did receive more than $80 billion in funding from the federal government and COVID relief funding, much to the governments and to school districts and other institutions mentioned in the higher ed. And so I think we started out from a place of misplaced priorities and we need to have a tax agreement of long-term permanent tax reform so that we can help our families do better. Uh, this bill never started out that way, and here today it does nothing to help students afford college. So members, I urge a no vote. I recognize the member from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when this bill uh, came uh, to the floor the last time I, I spoke against it and it hasn't gotten any better and I will articulate again some of the reasons why this bill is filled with gimmicks more than actual uh, product that uh, is saleable to the parents who want to spend an inordinate amount of money uh, in some cases to send their kids to college. I heard it again on this house floor that we're making college free. Nothing could be further from the truth. First, you fund it in the tails. You're only setting it up. The other reality is, based upon the formula that you're, you're using, you're making it free for the people who can afford it, not for the who, people who need it the most. Look at your scale. I'm surprised at the fact that we continue to say that this is affordable uh, education, that it's free somehow, that we need to freeze. I was speaking with someone who, this morning who now says that the cost of attendance at our largest institution in this state will go up by over 10 percent for those enrolling in the fall. 10 percent. And you're pleased with this bill? You talk about the hard-working families of this state providing funds so that their kids can get a great education. When we have 9,000 openings in cybersecurity that don't need a for education, and yet you do nothing in this bill to really have relevance in terms of where the jobs are needed, where the workforce is going to be needed. Who said that a four-year degree promises you a good life? 
No one. If you talk to any nameplate organization, it's about experiences. It's about the ability to think critically in a group setting or on your own and solve problems, not have a nameplate for your degree. We're still dealing in this state with bricks and mortar institutions that that's the only way that you're going to get a good life. Good grief. I've sat on this higher education uh, uh, committee off and on over my tenure in the, in the legislature, and I can honestly say this is a disappointment. When you take a look at the people that are coming out of high school and they have to have remedial education at the college level just to pass what they think is going to get them a good life. I can't tell you how frustrating it is to sit daily and hear about the needs of students that when they want this, they want this, they want this. We are coddling these kids. College is hard. It is not a right. You are giving them an opportunity to learn some life skills, to get into the workforce, to provide for themselves, for their family, and for their community. And what do we do in this bill? We're trying to make it a little easier for them to get a college education. The wrong way. It used to be when my grandfather looked at college, it was a hard journey. Not everybody was right to go to college. Nowadays, it's like if you don't go to college, you don't got a life. Where have we gone wrong? I know of many people in my caucus and yours who never went to college and are incredibly successful, have provided incredible philanthropic revenue and resources to their communities and to this state. And yet here we are coddling our higher education institutions. When are we going to wake up? You give them more money and what do they do? They raise tuition. They build more buildings. They want more and more and more. And yet what do we do? Well, we got to have a new program because we're not addressing this or we're not taking care of that. Or by golly, we need to make sure that they're taken care of. Gone are the days when college was a meaningful opportunity that people aspired to. Now it's expectant of them to get it. Members, this is an easy no vote. It's incredibly disappointing that we keep, keep layering money after money after money. It's like the money pit. It's fully funded. And every college around the state is looking at that thing. Thank you. Oh, by the way, tuition's going up. It's very, very disappointing. I look forward for response. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are clearly a lot of strong feelings about this bill. Um, some warm and fuzzy because, of course, everyone loves to spend money. Um, but some pretty frustrated and pretty upset and pretty angry. And uh, I'm in that camp. <laughs> I'm in that camp, and I want to go over some things. I mean, first of all, with this bill, 
We have already, for this biennium, for this budget, we have already put $100 million into higher education. We passed a budget last year that fully funded our state government. Uh, that was agreed on by Democrats and Republicans. $100 million went into higher education. Uh, this bill now adds another $20 million for this budget, and it's already spending $26 million in the next budget. Half the members in this chamber are not even going to be here to write the next budget, but they are already telling us what we have to spend. That's what this bill is doing today. And let's not forget that this $46 million is again on top of the, the money that we already spent. So I want to go with, through some numbers with you so you know what we're doing here. I'm sure you've all heard we've got a global budget agreement that includes $4 billion in spending, $4 billion in tax relief, and $4 billion on the bottom line. Um, this money, this $46 million, comes out of that $4 billion in spending bucket. That's where that's coming from. But let's go into that a little bit. Um, that $4 billion in spending, again, is on top of the budget that we already passed last year to fully fund state government. This is on top of that. Um, if we pass this budget, it will be the single largest budget increase from budget to budget, from biennium to biennium in recent history. Nonpartisan staff, the nonpartisan fiscal analyst, has told us that the increase in budget from one biennium to the next is 20%. A 20% budget increase. A 20% budget increase. That is what we are deciding to do as lawmakers, to grow government instead of growing family budgets when they are dealing with this Biden wall's economy and inflation. When they're going to pay $4.50 for a gallon of gas this summer, we are increasing state government by 20%. Instead of putting that money in their pockets so they can pay to feed their families. That's what this $46 million actually does. And now we've heard a lot of people say, well, but that's not really fair because, you know, in recent history we also haven't had a pandemic and so they need more money. Okay, well, that's, that's fair. The pandemic changed things, didn't it? The pandemic also put $80 billion, 80, I, that number doesn't even sound real. It literally sounds like a fake number. But I assure you, it is real. In fact, it is 79.7. So I guess I'm exaggerating with 80 billion. COVID put 80 billion dollars into Minnesota's economy over the last two years. 80 billion with a B. So please do not tell me how desperate Minnesota government is to spend more money. $80 billion has come into Minnesota via federal COVID relief. Interestingly, some numbers have been floating out about the potential tax bill. This is supposed to be our $4 billion in tax relief. Uh, and some numbers have been floating around. There's several things included. Um, some is actual tax relief, but um, about, well, when, when, when we calculated the numbers, it looked like about a third, but we've actually been told it's about 40% of the tax bill is actually more spending. This is not a $4 billion in spending, $4 billion in tax relief, $4 billion on the bottom line. That's not what this is. This is actually closer to five and a half, six billion dollars in spending to two and a half billion dollars in tax relief. That's what this global budget actually is. 
And let's say, let's even back out. Like I said, our nonpartisan fiscal analyst gave us the number of 20%. That's what this is, a 20% increase over the last biennium. Even if we back out the tax relief, because I think that's fair, backing out the tax relief, let's not include that as spending. Well, that puts us at 17%. The last time Democrats had total control of state government, they increased the budget by 12 and a half, or 12.2, I think it is, 12.2%. Now we're gonna do it by 17%? That's, I, I don't, you know what? We all, let's be honest, we all as legislators have our pet things. There's things that we really care about, things that really drive us in being here in this chamber. There are things that drive us, things that we want to do good work. And that's different for all of us. And I'm sure that there are folks who are here who are passionate about higher education and who really see where this $46 million can make a big difference. And I, I believe them, I trust my colleagues, this one doesn't happen to be my issue, but I believe them, I trust my colleagues, I am sure that there is always good work we can do with more money. We can always find stuff to do. That doesn't mean we have to do it, and it certainly doesn't mean that we should do it. For once in our lives, can we exercise just a bit of restraint? Can we acknowledge that we already increased the state budget from the last biennium to this one by almost 10%? We already did that. We already increased our budget by almost 10%. And now we're going to blow that out of the water. And for what? So you can feel good about your pet project? So you can feel good about your pet thing? Yes, of course. We, we can do all kinds of good things with all the money in the world. But guess what? Minnesota families also have to pay for their budgets. Minnesota families, in fact, I just, I just heard from a constituent this morning. She, um, she said that her, her bill for gas electricity, sewer, and water, those four things. Needs, by the way, not wants. That bill increased $200 from last month to, the, to this month. Last month it was 450 bucks to pay for those four things. This month it was $650 for her family to pay for those things. $650. $650. I, uh, I took a picture a couple weeks ago. I was at the grocery store. I was going to buy eggs. I actually didn't do it. I didn't buy the eggs that day because um, I, I've got five kids at home. I always buy the, the big, I think it's three dozen, two 18 packs of eggs. $10 at Walmart. I wasn't at Lunds and Byerly's. I was at Walmart, and it was 10 bucks for three dozen eggs. Economists are projecting that gas is going to be $4.50 a gallon this summer. I'm sorry, what was it? I'm sorry, $6.50. $6.50 a gallon. And instead of giving Minnesota families this money to put in their budgets, we're saying, no, no, we as legislators, we know better. We know better. This higher ed, they really, really need that 46 million. They really need that. I know that you're gonna have a tough time buying groceries this summer, but we really need this money over here. I know we already fully funded state government. I, already, I know we already passed a budget, but look, we have more, so let's give them more. What are we doing? What are we doing? You should be ashamed of yourselves. This is embarrassing. This is absolutely embarrassing. $80 billion into the state of Minnesota over the pandemic. $80 billion. We've already spent $100 million on higher education. It's never enough for you. 
It is never enough for Democrats. There will never be enough money for Democrats to spend. They cannot get enough. This is horrific what you are doing to Minnesota families, and I will be voting no. I recognize the author of the motion. I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some projects I've been working on in central Minnesota for, for a number of years, along with some of my other colleagues in the area. And we have a worker shortage in central Minnesota, and you probably have a worker shortage in your community as well. And that worker shortage is in the trades industry. I oftentimes will tell people about the experience that I had on a 4th of July weekend where my water heater um, went out and I tried to find someone to replace it. And just a word to the wise, when they say 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, that's, if you're, you're, you know, if you don't have a big problem, they won't be planning on coming out. Why? Because they don't have enough folks to be able to come out and to help. They're just short of staff. And the construction industry in the St. Cloud area where I'm from is just screaming for plumbers and electricians and screaming for more people in the trades industry. Now in St. Cloud, we're fortunate enough to have two different schools, post-secondary, that the state of Minnesota funds. One of those is the Tier Tech Community College, the second is St. Cloud State University. One is thriving and busting at the seams, and that's the Tech College. They are unable to, to have space. But four or five miles down the road, literally down the road, at St. Cloud State, they're losing students and they have excess capacity there in buildings and facilities. If we want to help students and if we want to help folks, it would seem to me to make sense that in the same community, four miles apart, that we would try to repurpose some of that space that's at St. Cloud State University for trade training. They're only four miles apart, geographically four miles apart. Plenty of parking, plenty of capacity. Put some money in to, to, to help with those. If you haven't already experienced it yourself of having to replace a water softener, a water heater, a furnace, get your car repaired, get, get some work done on things with the trades that pay darn good wages these days. you're going to find that you're on a waiting list to get those services. And in speaking to parents in my district, at graduation parties and talking to students, which we're all going to be a part of coming up shortly here, I'm going to talk to some students in my district where I've been invited to the grad party, and they're going to say, I'm going to college. What are you going to major in? Oh, I'm not sure yet. Why are you going to college? Well, my brother and my sister went there. My friends are going to college. And I just feel like that's the thing I need to do. So they go to a four-year college, finish out their freshman year, and then by Thanksgiving of their sophomore year, they come home with a big surprise for parents. Yeah, I'm leaving school. I'm quitting. Now they've got $30,000 of student loan debt that they've got to deal with. And you know what they end up doing? They end up going to that trade school. They end up going to that community college. And they find a skill. And now, not only do they have to pay for that schooling, they're on the hook for student loans for their first experience. Wouldn't it make sense, since we know we have a worker shortage, we know we're going to need to backfill all of these trade areas to do something within the higher education bill to help multiple problems get solved. And oh, by the way, St. Cloud's located in the central part of the state. So it's not a large drive for anyone in the state of Minnesota who wants to go to school there to get those skills. Again, they are screaming for help. We talk about why prices are the way they are. Part of this is a labor shortage. Some of it's also going to be supply chain. But even if we fix the supply chain and there aren't people to do masonry work, 
do electric work, do plumbing work, do all those other specialized areas. We're not solving a housing problem that I'm sure we're going to be hearing about in another bill that's coming up later on. Folks, we've got to push the pause button and reset our priorities or we're going to have a huge, huge problem in this country. People are looking to us right here, right now, to make those decisions that are going to set us up for success, not only in this country, but as a world leader in the next 50 to 100 years. We are on the dawn of that day. Members, vote no. This doesn't solve Minnesota's long-term problems. Any further discussion? I recognize the author of the motion, the member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We had a little history lesson today, and I want to share another little history lesson. I came in in 2001, and in the early 2000s, when Governor Pawlenty was the governor in a Republican-controlled legislature, we bal the, they balanced the budget of, they balanced the budget on our students, that deficit that we had that year. And students have not recovered. They have mountains of, death, of debt, mountains of debt. And it is, um, I just want to share, Minnesota had a commitment and has it in their state statute to fund two thirds of a, a student's public education. During that time, that was flipped upside down and it was almost turned to the exact, it was almost turned to the exact opposite where students were having to almost pay two thirds of their education. We can, we can do better. We have to help our students. We, I've, we do not have a $12 billion surplus. I don't call it a $12 billion sur surplus when our students are out there with mountains of debt. This is preventing from students from starting families, from buying their first home, from being able to enjoy life and travel like in um, entertainment like other people do. Without, without having that mountain of death, it, uh, debt, I say, keep saying death, it probably feels really like that sometimes for students with, this, with these mountains of debt. We need to be investing in education, and this surplus needs to be investing in our students so that we can turn it around so a student can work part-time, they can finish their degree in four years, and they can graduate without a mountain of debt. So members, I am not pleased that we had the Republican target of 20 million for FY23, and we didn't get their $20 million target for the, um, for the tails, as we call them, we got 23 million. I was not happy with that. We need to be investing in our students, bringing down the um, cost of education, and supporting our students, and using what that so-called surplus that was balanced on the backs of students back in the Republican-controlled time in the early 2000s. We need to turn that upside down and, again, invest two-thirds of a student's education, um, the state support for a student's education, and allow them to go to school, earn their credentials, and be able to thrive and have opportunity for them and their families. Thank you, members. I encourage a yes vote. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
Will the clerk please call the names of members who have not yet voted? Bonner. Bonner, aye. Bonner, aye. Barr. Barr, no. Barr, no. Becker, Finn. Becker, Finn, aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Bo. Bo, no. Bo, no. Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Daphne. Daphne. Hamilton. Hamilton, no. Hamilton, no. Houseman. Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Hollins. Hollins, I. Hollins, I. Hornstein. Hornstein, I. Hornstein, I. Lislegard. I. Lislegard, I. Lucero. Lucero, no. We got to make sure that. Lucero, no. Mariani. Mariani, I. Mariani, I. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. Sandell. Sandell, I. Thompson. Thompson, I. Thompson, I. Davney. Davney. The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 63 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by conference in its title agreed to.